every era of great scientific discovery comes to an end. And well, in the field of molecular biology, that moment has now officially arrived. And that's because just recently, James Watson, the last surviving member of the team credited for discovering the magnificent structure of DNA, has passed away at the incredible age of 97. And by the way, here's what he looked like back in the early 2000s. And so in this video, we're basically going to discuss the famous double helix. One of the most famous discoveries and the most famous icon of the 20th century science, whose story and whose discovery had the vast implications on everything in science, but is also far more complex and dramatic than most high school textbooks usually convey. And so in this video we're going to briefly discuss the history behind this discovery, in order to commemorate and to remember the team behind this discovery, but also to understand how we managed to unlock the secrets inside this fundamental molecule, and why this acidic polymer continues to shape our present and defines our future. But obviously let's start with the idea behind DNA, the blueprint of life itself. And at its core DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, is a polymer that carries the complete set of genetic instructions required for the development, functioning, growth and reproduction of nearly all life on our planet. And I'm saying nearly because some life requires RNA only. And as the name implies, this molecule looks like a kind of a twisted ladder, or more formally a double helix, composed of two long polymers coiled around the same central axis. And every single chain in this case is made out of repeating simpler units referred to as nucleotides. Here's basically what their structure looks like. Three main parts, a sugar, a phosphate group, and one of four distinct nitrogen-containing bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine or thymine. But the truly ingenious part of the structure is that they always seem to come in pairs. Adenine always pairs with thymine, guanine always pairs with cytosine. This is known as the complementary base pairing. Although more informally and in a lot of textbooks it's also referred to as the Watson Creek base pair, basically named after the founders. And the way this pairing is achieved is through the very weak hydrogen bonds. But AT pairs are held by two hydrogen bonds, CG pairs contain three bonds, and that means that fundamentally some of the structures are going to be more stable than others. And so biologically many parts of DNA that need to separate easily, for example signals involving gene copying, will usually contain AT pairs in order to make these strands open much easier. And well, these pairs are actually important because that's essentially how scientists were able to finally figure out how the structure here works. And so, okay, let's discuss the history and how all of this started. And the history in this case is very messy, and technically starts over 150 years ago. Because this was not just some kind of a single eureka moment, this was a century long process of research and involved a lot of collaboration but also quite a lot of controversy. And um, a lot of inattentive scientists who basically fell asleep. But back in 1869, Swiss chemist Friedrich Meiser isolated an unusual substance containing phosphorus from various white blood cells, and he actually found this on discarded surgical bandages from someone's injury. He called these particles nucleins. And so the story here starts kind of gross. He literally extracted the fundamental molecule from someone's pus. And so since then, for decades, the field of biology mistakenly believed that proteins, and specifically these nucleins, were the actual molecules responsible for the genetic information and contain everything we need to construct a person. Ironically, DNA and anything related to it was very often dismissed as some kind of a useless repeating tetranucleotide that potentially only served in a structural role. And this continued for nearly 100 years. But then, a Russian biochemist, Phoebus Levin, discovered something that nobody ever considered before. Here he discovered that some of the DNA in this case was composed of nucleotides, sugars, phosphates and bases. And that was just a little bit too complex for a simple structural molecule. And so by 1940s, another scientist, Erwin Shagraff, discovered that in DNA from any organism, surprisingly the amount of adenine seems to be almost exactly the same as thymine in every single case. And so here he established what's known as the Shagraff rule. A bizarre observation that for some reason any life, any organism, seems to always contain very similar amounts of adenine and thymines and very similar amounts of guanines and cytosines. And this pattern became a profound clue. But this wonderful person himself could not really figure it out. It remained a mystery for at least a decade. And it was really in the 1950s that we had this final drama. And mostly in two main labs in England. King's College and Cambridge. 
And so in that first camp, in the King's College, we had Maurice Wilkins, who passed away back in 2004, and Rosalind Franklin, who passed away really early in 1958. And they managed to do something that nobody ever thought of before. They used what's known as crystallography, or X-ray diffraction, to study some of these DNA fibers. And so Wilkins was the first to produce an extremely high-quality image back in 1950, and later Franklin and her student produced the most definitive data, including the famous image referred to as Photo 51. This is a photo showing us an X-ray diffraction pattern of a DNA molecule. And here Franklin, who was a very careful chemist, determined that the phosphate backbones had to be on the outside of the molecule in order for this to make sense. Meanwhile, at Cambridge, the young American biologist James Watson and the English physicist Francis Crick were trying to piece together their DNA model because they were convinced that this was actually where all of the genetic material was stored. And though they were driven partly by competition, especially with the celebrated chemist Linus Pauling, who was also trying to propose his own model, naturally curiosity also played a major role. But the approach of these two camps, the King's College and the Cambridge camp, was very different. For example, the Franklin's team opposed any speculation and model building and actually insisted on just using x-rays and just creating new data in order to see what's really going on here. Whereas both Watson and Creek decided to focus on models and wanted to actually physically create something in order to understand if it was even possible. And so developing a correct model of DNA involved several failed attempts, including a very erroneous first model. And this was their model in 1951. And so in this first model that was mostly driven by competition with Linus Pauling, who they were afraid was going to discover the actual structure first, they produced what's known as a triple helix. Three chains instead of two, that would possibly resemble something like this. And this model was not just erroneous, it was embarrassingly bad. Here the major mistake was actually placing hydrophilic phosphate backbones in the central core with their bases pointing outwards. In terms of chemistry this made very little sense. And one of the main reasons they even had this mistake was because of Watson. Specifically Watson's insufficient note-taking during one of the presentations by Rosalind Franklin when she was presenting a crucial piece of information with some sources saying that he wasn't paying attention at all. Moreover, Francis Crick also missed a crucial seminar in 1951, because apparently he was seeing a lover and did not bother to go. And so all of the presentations by Franklin were more or less ignored for at least one year. And during his presentations, she essentially showed them this. If they had seen this earlier, they would have known the correct position for phosphate units on the external part of the molecule and would not have produced their triple helix. But luckily, eventually they abandoned this initial model and realized that it just wouldn't work. With their eventual success coming in 1953, when they finally obtained accurate specific data that resolved previous assumptions, and when Rosalind Franklin pointed out that there was just no way for this triple helix to work. With additional experiments by John Mason Gulland, specifically showing evidence that DNA separation in water could not be produced if the hydrophilic phosphate containing backbones were on the inside instead of being outside. Or just to rephrase this, DNA in water would be acting very differently if it was a triple helix molecule that was initially proposed. And so following this initial setback, Watson and Creek completely threw away this model and started from scratch. Actually, at first they were thinking of abandoning this, but in early 1953, another scientist, Lawrence Bragg, encouraged them to continue modeling, especially because by then the famous Linus Pauling turned out to be incorrect as well, and whose model also did not make sense. And so for their second, more successful attempt, they were finally able to use a very important piece of information. Or actually two pieces of information. First, they realized that the fact that adenine and thymine, as well as guanine and cytosine, were always in pretty much the same amounts, this implied that there was some kind of a pairing going on inside the DNA itself. And this pairing was very likely complementary and involved a very specific structure. At the same time, based on the information from Rosalind Franklin and Raymond Gosling's work, and specifically that photo 51, which he finally saw in January of 1953, and that was shown to him by Maurice Wilkins, he finally realized that the structure must have been double and not triple, and that the helical structure was very likely inversed from what they previously assumed. And so by using an extremely detailed report produced by Rosalind Franklin, Crick realized that the structure had to contain an equal number of anti-parallel strands, very likely running in opposite directions. And so by combining this with the Chagrav's rules, which stated that the amount of A and T, C and G has to be equal, both Watson and Crick eventually realized that there's only one model that seems to make sense. There was a very specific complementary base pairing between A and T, 
that contained two hydrogen bonds, and C and G that contained three bonds, which allowed the bases to fit perfectly within the consistent double helix structure, which they then recreated by using models. And so by March 7th of 1953, Watson and Creek finally finished building their first prototype. And this is what you can still see in the Science Museum in London, with this very specific pairing also suggesting that it seems to be very simple to copy, and once again suggesting that this is indeed the genetic material we've been looking for for a very long time. And well, in 1962, Watson, Crick and Wilkins shared the Nobel Prize. And unfortunately, Franklin, whose contribution was absolutely enormous, could not receive the prize because she died in 1958. Although even today there is a bit of a controversy over the proper acknowledgement of Franklin's contribution, even though today most scientists agree that she was an equal contributor and would have probably won the prize as well if she had survived. And so once they constructed the structure, its function became pretty clear almost right away. And this right here was the foundation for modern molecular biology with Francis Crick eventually formalizing the flow of information that was then described as DNA becoming RNA becoming protein, something that you can basically find in all modern biological textbooks. Although obviously so much more has been discovered since then, with so many more mysteries and so many more unanswered questions about DNA still to be discovered and still to be researched. For example, back then they actually did not know that only 1.5% of the total DNA sequence codes for proteins, with most of the DNA over 98% being non-coding. And though when I was in school this was referred to as the junk DNA, with many scientists basically claiming that it was possibly useless, today we are pretty certain that's not the case. It seems to be absolutely crucial, but we still have no idea what most of it does. And so our understanding of this molecule is still not complete. For example, today we know that the B DNA structure identified by Watson and Creek seems to be the most common form. In this case, B DNA is basically right-handed. But turns out DNA is very dynamic and it can actually change shapes and change its forms. It can essentially twist itself like a rope in a process referred to as supercoiling. And sometimes can switch from the B DNA to Z DNA, which is left-handed and is literally inverse. Now usually it doesn't do so for a long time and goes back to its right-handed stage, but we still actually have no idea why it does this, even though it potentially plays important biological roles such as, for example, fighting viruses. And so even when it comes to the structure of this molecule, there are still so many unanswered questions and so much we still don't know. Nevertheless, this molecule definitely has an enduring legacy. From Meiser initial discovery of these bizarre proteins inside the pus, to the modern ability to map the entire genome in these, and even discover individual genes which some of us might share. And so in some sense this is one of the most important discoveries in human history and something that we're still going to be learning about for decades to come. But once again, the reason I'm making this video is because the last pioneer of the discovery, James Watson, has now passed away. And so with him, the legacy of the discovery of this molecule officially ends. Obviously not the research and not the new discoveries, and so he'll unfortunately never know what else we discover about this wonderful molecule. The elegant, anti-parallel, self-replicating double helix the central organizing principle of all life on the planet. But despite of this, that journey that started in the 19th century is still only in its infancy. We still have so much more to learn and still so much more to discuss on this channel because everything about DNA always fascinates me. And so we'll definitely come back and discuss more discoveries and more unusual research in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads, and can DM it directly, or by joining a channel membership that grants you early access. You can also buy the wonderful person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.